So hi, and welcome to Poetry Passages. I'm Clifford Rames, and it's great to be back with our second installment of the David Budbill Poetry Series, a celebration of the life and poetry of David Budbill. In partnership with the literary estate of David Budbill, over the course of the year, we will be welcoming a number of special guests on Poetry Passages, um, people who knew David Budbill and adored his work, and they will discuss what David meant to them and read a few poems, maybe uh, one, two, or three, however, however many they would like. Uh, for anyone who is not familiar with David Budville, David was a small town poet and playwright from Vermont, where he lived in a cabin in the woods for over 40 years. Among his many works, David authored eight books of poetry and seven plays. And for more information, you can check out davidbudbill.com. Joining me today is Vermont poet and translator, Jody Gladding, whose poem, Blue Willow, I featured back in episode 115 for Earth Day. Jody has published four full-length collections of poetry and two letterpress edition chapbooks. She has also translated over 40 books into French from, from French into English, and taught in the MFA program at, at the Vermont College of Fine Arts, and has directed the writing program at the Vermont Studio Center in Johnston, Johnson, Vermont. In 1992, she won the Yale Younger Poets Prize for her book, Stone Crop, which I happen to have right here. <laughs> and it's so great to introduce Jody Gladding, Gladding to you today. So hi, Jody. How are you? Hi, good. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on the program and to take mm -hmm. some time to share your recollections of David Budbill with us. So I read somewhere that your work explores the places where language and landscapes converge. The places where language and landscape converge sounds right up David Budbill's alley. Am, am I right in saying that? Is, yeah. I think so, yeah. <laughs> and so could you tell us a little bit about um, how you first connected with David Budbill and, and, and what ways he, he may have influenced you as, as, as a poet? Sure, I'm happy to, and thanks for inviting me. It's nice sure. to be here. <laughs> Thank I used you. to spend a little time with David, um, which I did. I have been doing for the last couple of days and getting ready. <laughs> getting ready would, for this. Yeah, um, I would like to start with the poem. I think it it will help explain uh, sure. how we knew David and and uh, what he has meant to to me and and my husband um, and our family. So this is September visitors from his book uh, Happy Days, Happy, uh, Happy Life. I'm sorry and which came out in 2011. Yeah, there it is. Um, and it's just a short poem. Um, September Visitors. I'm glad to see our friends come. Talk, laughter, food, wine. I'm glad to see our friends go. Solitude, emptiness, gardens, autumn wind. So um, we were, uh, among those friends coming and going <laughs> from David and Lois's house in Wolcott, Vermont. Um, I think we met in about 1990. Um, uh, we had recently moved to Vermont, my husband and I, to uh, near Montpelier, out, outside Montpelier. Um, and um, we were working in a wonderful little bookstore in, in Montpelier, Bear Pond Books. And mm. um, David Hinton, my husband, is a, is a Chinese translator and poet. And he had just recently published his um, selected translations of Du Fu. It come out, I think, in uh, 1989. And David Budville, um, who we knew a little bit, or we had seen coming in and out of the bookstore, sent um, David Hinton, my husband, a fan letter, <laughs> basically saying how much he liked the book and, and how you know, he'd like to get together. Um, and he was already, you know, David Budwell was already in, he was always really interested in Chinese poetry, but he was already in beginning that mode of the Jude Bryan poet poem. So, you know, 
that part of his interest lay there. So they, he and his wife Lois E.B., who is a wonderful painter and, and a really close friend of ours, um, now came over to our little house. We were living on a lake um, and we had Chinese tea together. And I think that must have been about 1990. So, um, you know, that's a good 30 some years ago now. And that was really the beginning of a, a long and wonderful friendship. Um, so you selected the book Happy Life by David Budville. And I was just wondering um, what your connection to that book is. Why did you choose that book from, from all of his books? And is it just one of your favorites or? Yeah, I think uh, for me, well, I, I, you know, I think I choose, I chose this book in particular because I was looking for poems that really spoke about our, my, my feelings about David and, and, um, and I think in this book in particular, he's in that mode of writing very simple poems and, um, about the life that he chose and made for himself. And, uh, and he's kind of, he hasn't, the later books, he's, he's so much, he's looking so much toward, uh, he's looking so much at his own mortality. Um, and this one, he's still kind of at the, you know, it's there, but he's still sort of at the height, height of things rather than right. the, the decline. So there is some ha ha more happiness. I more think, happiness, yeah. In this, in this book, yeah. Yeah, it, it got me wondering if that, if, if David were alive now and, and during the pandemic, um, given his nature as being both a recluse, but also a very welcoming host right. to anybody who visited him at, at, at Judavine, um, do you think he would have gotten on Zoom? Do you think he would have gotten into that? <laughs> I mean, he seems so content in his solitude, but yet, you know, again, he was such a welcoming host. So yeah. I kind of wonder what what route he would have taken if he would have just shunned the whole Zoom thing. No, he wouldn't have. I think, <laughs> um, but he he was he he was not you know a, a luddite in terms of uh, adapting to technology. I mean, he, he was, um, and he was very, very sociable. So I think it, it, he probably would have had to um, take up Zoom just, you know, to, to satisfy his, his need for, for other people. Um, and I think he would have, you know, kind of enjoyed it in, you know, in whatever ways he can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next poem you selected is uh, Sweet Early Spring. Um, and it's a time that we're kind of sort of moving out of now, at least here in New Jersey. I don't know about up there in Vermont. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're still right, right in the midst of it. <laughs> right in the midst That's of it, right. yeah. Um, so just tell, tell me how this poem really speaks to you. Well, um, shall, shall I read it first? Sure, if you want to read it first and then we can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Randall, go on. Go on. Sorry, I've got a dog here. <laughs> Sweet early spring. When the understory of the woods is flattened and you can see the contours of the earth, the rock outcroppings, all this just after the last pockets of snow disappear while everything is still sear, brown, gray, when now and then a woodcock whistles or you can hear a lone goose going somewhere. All this, this sweet early spring with no bugs at all, none, not a single one. This clear, beautiful and brief moment, this emptiness. This is the time I love the best before the world fills up again with insects, leaves, brush, birds, green, a last brief rest, quiet and peace before I have to turn and face the lush and fertile noisy spring. So I did choose this because this is exactly the moment we're in right now here. Um, and I, you know, as I was looking for poems, it just struck me how perfectly he captures it and how it's not a moment that I've ever really loved, but in capturing it, um, he, he makes, he makes one love it. And 
I think that is, you know, one of David's real strengths. Yeah, I mean, it, it struck me too because as I as I read it um, again, yeah, it, it perfectly describes that time of year that you don't really think much about. You know, the freeze, the deep freeze is over, the the ground has thawed, the trees haven't quite budded yet. All the leaves are leaves are flattened from the snow, and you kind of see the true contours of the landscape, as you said, the outcrops and all yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he just kind of suddenly put a spotlight on that and, and made it something that is remarkable. Like, yeah, why didn't, why didn't I think of that? Yeah, um, and I think, um, you know, normally that time is sort of filled with impatience because you're, you're wanting to be into spring. Get, get into <laughs> it already, like, right? Yeah. This is the moment <laughs> I appreciate. You know, right, right. I, I'm, I'm happy for spring to be, you know, off a little bit still um just I, I, yeah i did have to laugh a little bit that I, I did notice that he left out the mud <laughs> <laughs> maybe up there on the high slopes of, of, of judavine there wasn't much mud more no, rock, more rock than mud, mud. <laughs> but yeah he kind of conveniently left yeah. the mud out <laughs> I, I had to laugh at that but yeah beautiful poem thank you for selecting that uh so speaking of Jud judavine did you ever ever visit him visit him at judavine i mean i know it's not a real place but that's what he named his mountain um did you ever actually go up there to judavine mountain no we were always it was interesting because we were always kind of planning a hike mm -hmm. um, which never happened <laughs> and <laughs> oh. I, I don't know how often actually david ever went there i mean there was a there's a lot of you know creating this character um Jude Vine Mountain, there's a, there's creation in that. I yeah. mean, um, and, and, you know, David was totally aware of that. He, he wouldn't, I'm not revealing any secrets here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, well, and that brings, that brings us to the third poem that you chose, Question and Answer, because it reminded me of um, something the New York Times wrote, which was, they described David Budbill as a latter-day Thoreau with a dash of Walt Whitman and Carl Sandburg. But it's really the Thoreau part that I latched onto because, you know, he did live up in the woods before he moved to Montpelier in his, in his elder years. He did live in the woods for 40 right. years. Yeah. Um, Henry David Thoreau only lived in the woods for two years, and yet he got he got all the fame. <laughs> so there's a <laughs> yeah, he, he wait for it. <laughs> right. But you're but you're but the poem you're about to read kind of yeah. lays it out perfectly yeah. and succinctly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's and I will say, you know, David and Lois's house, which they built, was um much more a permanent place than Thoreau Thoreau's, than Thoreau's little cabin, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean Thoreau had his row of beans, but David had a huge garden. So <laughs> and it, it was it, it was, Thoreau's was more an experiment of really stripping down, where right. David's was like, I'm going to make a life here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's for the duration. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I love that. It's the perfect description of an experiment versus this is my life, you know, yeah. 40 years. Um, so would you like to read question and answer? Sure. Hmm. Question and answer after Libo. It was another one of the ancient Chinese poet recluses. You ask me why I live on this green mountain. I smile, no answer. Come, live here 40 years. You'll see. You'll see. <laughs> so what is it about that poem that affects you and makes just kind of... Well, to me... It's the David's legacy also. Yeah, yeah it kind of, it, it sums... It sums up the, um, what, the kind of, uh, the, the um, emphasis on living the life mm. as opposed to, uh, well, his poems, the life becomes the subject of his poems. So he does talk about it, right. but he talks about it out of living experience. Yeah. And the, the talking about it never replaces the lived experience of it. Um, 
and 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 you know in this poem kind of is you only can know it by by doing it and you know that that's really all i i can finally say i, yeah. I can tell you these things but you know yeah you, you know, know the story behind the lipo dedication or oh he just um david read Ch the Chinese poets oh, wow, all yeah. the time. So, yeah. you know, Li Bo, uh, I don't know exactly which poem he's alluding to. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. I, was, I was wondering it myself, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think there is a Li Bo poem that says, you ask me why I live here. It's not this green mountain, <laughs> it's yeah. whatever mountain. And I don't, I, I honestly don't know what his mm -hmm. answer mm -hmm. is. I should look that up, yeah, good question. <sighs> So just kind of in your in your sort of opinion, what what do you think is David Bill's lasting legacy to poetry? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, it could be very something very simple. Or... Yeah, I don't. You know, it's really hard um, to have that kind of retrospective yet. I mean, mm -hmm. David's gone, but but about. Five years, I think, or yeah, six. six. About six years, I think. About yeah. six years. So yeah. um, I don't yet have a sense of that. I mean, I I feel like if people are reading him now, it, it may well be because he presents a sort of model for a writing life, which is very different from um, the normal urban academic model. Right. And for people who are, you know, interested in pursuing a writing life, it's kind of all laid out there in, in his poems. Yeah, it's very biographical style of writing. I mean, when you read David yeah. Bell's books, you feel like you really, you get inside his life. You know, you see his daily activities and chopping wood and stirring the stew and, exactly. and, and planting the beans and, you know, and yeah. um, watching the, the wisps of wood smoke. Um, and I think there are probably a lot of urban poets for whom all those things seem exotic <laughs> and yeah. maybe really, you know, inviting. And, right, yeah. and if you can do that and do your art, <laughs> you know. Right, yeah. But this was his life, as we said earlier. It wasn't, it wasn't an experiment. And, and as you just said, it's a, a lesson in, in living your work, right? Just um, uh, that, that sort of perfect mesh between your life and your work that just kind of somehow right. works perfectly yeah, yeah. David Budville did that yeah. yeah well great thank you so much for for reading those three poems um I know you have an announcement to make you have a new book coming right oh I yes <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah yeah um it will be out in the fall and it's called I entered without words right published and, by um, um, Princeton yeah. University Press right Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll look forward to that. And one and just thanks so much for doing this. It's been wonderful. And uh, and I hope everyone out there enjoyed it. And stay tuned for more poetry passages. And we'll see you again real soon. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Jody Gladding, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>